There we go. Okay. Could I have your attention, please? Uh, I apologize for the unfortunate delay in starting our uh, debate tonight. Uh, my name is uh, Gordon Drake. Uh, I'll be moderating the uh, debate. Um, I, and uh, I just want to let you know that uh, everyone is here except for the uh, Reverend Joe Boot, who was unfortunately involved in a car accident. Uh, he, he wasn't injured, but the, this is the reason for his, uh, his delay. I uh, understand that he is uh, at Chatham, and uh, so we'll be here in about another half hour. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to put on an impromptu program of uh, background information about, uh, uh, about the, the, the two organizations uh, uh, that, uh, will be, that are sponsoring this uh, event. Uh, Shauna Scott will be talking to you about the uh, Windsor, Windsor and Essex County uh, Atheist Association, and uh, Jordan, uh, Jordan, there's Jordan right there, will uh, tell us something about the uh, InterVarsity Christian uh, Fellowship uh, organization that's actually sponsoring the uh, event uh, tonight. Um, just before I, I, I turn it over to, uh, to Shauna, uh, I'll just say that, uh, as I say, my name is Gordon Drake. I'm a member of the physics department here at the U University of Windsor. Uh, and I'm also principal of Canterbury College, uh, which is the Anglican College affiliated with the University of Windsor. So uh, I suppose I have one foot in each camp, so to speak. Uh, and uh, it's, been, it's been a longstanding interest of mine, uh, the relationship between science and religion. Being a physicist, I'm very much involved in uh, studying and understanding the laws of nature, uh, and, but then is, does that necessarily imply a conflict uh, with religion? And so this has been a, a longstanding interest of mine, uh, and I could give a whole talk just on that topic. Uh, I think that, the, that it can, that there, there are not, uh, irreconcilable differences. They're talking about different things, but I don't want to get too much into the details of, the, of what's going to be debated uh, tonight. Uh, so let me turn it uh, over to uh, Shauna. Uh, Shauna, would you like to, to speak next? And uh, she'll tell you a little about the, the, uh, um, her uh, uh, organization. So, Shauna. <laughs> Before I get started, I'd first like to um, thank our sponsors for this evening. Our sponsors include Freedom From Religion Foundation, Ontario Public Interest Research Group, also known as Oper Windsor, Secular Student Alliance, and Centre for Inquiry Ontario. So give a round of applause. So I guess I'm going to discuss our um, group and what we're all about. I wasn't planning on doing it, but I'd be happy to uh, put a plug in for our group. So <laughs> here we go. Um, we are the Windsor Essex County Atheist Society. We were so happy to work with the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship to put on this event. We've been working hard since October last year um, as a team to get everybody here together. And thank you for everybody who came tonight. I know some people even came from Michigan, Ohio. Um, several places over Ontario, so thank you again. Um, a bit about our group. We're a ratified student group at the University of Windsor. We do have some uh, non-students in our group as well. We meet the third Friday of every month at Dominion House. Um, we hold meetings to discuss various things, for example, um, mental health of non-believers. We discuss uh, various situations some of our members are in. We also participate in things like blood drives. We raised um, over $630 for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada. Um, we have participated in conferences such as Secular Student Alliance Conference, Reason Rally, Skepticon 3, Skepticon 4, and actually that's where I met Dan Barker. And um, recently we had lobbied to get the prayer uh, replaced by a moment of reflection here at the university for convocation. So that was uh, something that we worked on as well. Um, I guess if you're interested in hearing more about our group, we have a table set up over the side and Cheryl's over there. Um, and we have items for sale. We have lots of freebies as well. So please come on by and uh, visit us over there. Um, during the break would be a good time to do that as, that as well or after the event tonight. 
Okay, and I'm going to pass it over to Jordan, and then I'm going to introduce Dan Barker. Um, he'll speak a bit before uh, the debate begins. Like Shauna, um, so yeah, like, like Shauna said, I'm Jordan Legg. I uh, am one of many people running University Christian Fellowship. Um, and we are, as Shauna said, partnered with the Windsor Essex Atheist Society. Um, and they've, they've done the uh, majority of the legwork uh, putting this, this, um, this event together. So thanks very much, guys. Really appreciate that. Um, a lot of great work. Uh, very exciting. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm with University Christian Fellowship. I'm not the president. The president is back there at the donations table. His name is Dave. You can't see. There, there's a wave. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Um, we're really excited about this event because uh, we, you know, we think it's a, a great topic, a very important topic, one that we all have to face. And so we're looking forward to it. Um, InterVarsity is, is really a, a Christian uh, group on campus that is essentially designed to, um, through, through various means and methods, uh, love God and love others as per Jesus' great commandment in, uh, in the Gospels. And, and so we're really excited to do that. Part of doing that, I believe, is, is loving God with the minds that he's given us. And so that's why we've put this debate together. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very exciting um, opportunity to do that and to engage with another group on campus and whatnot. Uh, we've got all sorts of things going on. Um, Bible studies, you know, three days out of five every week. And then uh, on Mondays and Fridays, we got other stuff going on too. Um, so we're, we're essentially about uh, finding a way to provide community for Christian students on campus and to um, engage with, with other people on campus to understand who Jesus is and what he did and, and what he's all about. Um, so yeah, as I said, we're really excited and we hope you enjoyed tonight's debate. Thanks. Well, I might just say a little more about uh, what Canterbury College is. Uh, there's an interesting history. Canterbury College has existed since 1957 when it was it's an Anglican college, but at the invitation of Assumption uh, University College, uh, was invited to, to form an affiliated college. This is before the University of Windsor even existed. Um, the, this, and this was the first such uh, partnership between a Roman Catholic uh, institution and a Protestant college in the world. So it's uh, of quite some historical significance that this uh, event took place here uh, at Windsor. And since then, it has provided, uh, along with the uh, uh, Roman Catholic side, an Anglican presence uh, at the uh, University of Windsor. The third such uh, college is Iona, which is the, uh, on the uh, United Church side. So what does, what does Canterbury College do? We have, we have three main uh, programs. We provide residence accommodation for uh, about 140 students and, uh, and we like to emphasize providing the kind of academic environment that uh, is conducive to, uh, to good uh, study, good, uh, um, uh, for, uh, enable students to achieve their uh, academic goals. Uh, the, uh, the second is the educational component. Uh, we provide uh, uh, various kinds of, of courses, many of them of a theological nature, uh, for uh, people who are um, uh, uh, in the uh, diaconate uh, uh, program, people uh, um, uh, taking uh, courses also uh, toward a, a master's uh, degree, but. Uh, recently, we've launched Elder College, which is, uh, uh, and some of you may have heard of uh, Elder College. It's, uh, this is a uh, program for uh, people who have uh, retired over the age of 55, but we don't check IDs. So if you, uh, if people who want to take a course can, can do so. These are short courses, fun, uh, no exams, no, no tests, just courses for the fun of it on a huge variety of topics. Uh, we're offering 70 courses just this semester on uh, uh, a wide range of things, all the way from uh, ancient history to in, uh, courses on appreciation of wine and, uh, and uh, such things as that. So, uh, if you're if you're interested, uh, I'm just putting a little plug for the uh, our Elder College program. Uh, if you just go to 
uh, uh, uwinsor.ca slash elder college. That will take you to the, uh, to the website. Um, so uh, perhaps we, uh, we can, uh, I think our, our next uh, item then is to uh, uh, allow uh, Dan Barker an opportunity. Were you going to say some words of uh, introduction about it? So would you like to do that? Too? Thank you for that, Dr. Dury. We appreciate that. So I guess back in October, when our club was trying to decide who to have for our debate, we had to think back on our club's goals and our, what we're trying to do as a group. So the Windsor Atheists, we're about promoting and practicing open, open, rational, and scientific examination of the universe and our place in it. We also want to organize activities to educate the surrounding community, foster the acceptance of non-belief, and advocate for secularism. On behalf of the Windsor Essex County Atheist Society, I would like to express how ecstatic we are to have Dan Barker with us today. <laughs> he has traveled all the way from Madison, Wisconsin to be with us this, this evening. He has a unique background in that he was an evangelical preacher for 19 years, but became an atheist. In fact, Mr. Barker told me earlier that the last time he was in the Windsor area, he was preaching. Um, <laughs> he is, as you know, he is co-founder of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which is an organization that fights for secular values, which means keeping God out of government. Finally, he has written numerous books, one that's already sold out at our table, um, Godless, How an Evangelical Preacher Became One of America's Leading Atheists. Let's give a warm welcome to Dan Barker. Well, thank you, Shauna. Shauna is very humble. I don't know if you know. She's something of a champion, a hero, when it comes to state church separation. She briefly mentioned the prayer issue, but Shauna started complaining about graduation prayers, how, what, two, three years ago? And uh, kept at it and was persistent and had a very simple victory of stopping prayers at graduation. So people, if they wanna pray, they can. If they wanna have a moment of silence, if they want to worship Mother Goose or just think about physics or whatever, they can do that now, which is, uh, is kind of interesting. One of the lines in one of my songs, I'm, st I'm still writing songs, by the way, um, is about, um, it's called the Freethinker Blues. I worked hard for my diploma, but my graduation was so odd. They got up and prayed and gave all the credit to someone else's God. Uh, don't, you know, I get the Freethinker Blues. And have, have you ever thought, you, God's not the one who's stayed up all night cramming and studying and working. It's the graduates themselves who are being honored. So uh, thank you, Shauna. That's a real, a real champion for doing what you did. The Freedom from Religion Foundation started almost the same way. Annie Laurie Gaylor, by the way, I'm not one of the co-founders, I'm a co-president. Annie Laurie Gaylor was a college student, just like you, in the University of Wisconsin-Madison. They were praying at the graduation there, back in the 70s. And she said, that's not right. This is for all students. It's for Hindus, it's for atheists, it's for Christians, it's for Jews, it's for everybody. So why are we having a prayer at a secular university? And so she asked around and she found out that it was students who were running you know, deciding what to happen. So she went to the student committee and she said, um, why are we praying? And they said, we don't know, we've always done it. And she said, do you have to? And they said, I guess we don't, do we? So they just stopped. They just decided not to do it and it stopped a 150 year tradition. And other schools in Wisconsin said, yeah, we don't have to do that either. Let's be more inclusive. Let's not be divisive. Let's include all students in it. And the Freedom From Religion Foundation started with simple issues like that. Annie Laurie is tonight talking in Champaign, Illinois for the 65th anniversary of the McCollum decision. In the United States, there's a famous 1948 decision, McCollum versus Board of Education, where they were having religious instruction in the public schools during school hours. The McCollum family complained 
they lost. They complained again and they lost. They sued in the state and they lost. They appealed to the state Supreme Court and they lost. And then they appealed to the United States Supreme Court and with an eight to one decision, it was overturned. That McCollum versus Board of Education is a pivotal champion lawsuit which protects religious freedom, the freedom of conscience in our public schools. So Annie Laurie is down there with two of the little boys who were in that family in the 1940s. They're now in their late 70s, uh, Jim and Daniel McCollum, to celebrate that victory, celebrating, protecting uh, religious freedom, the freedom of conscience. So that's one of the things that our organization does. It works for the separation of religion and government, which is good for everybody. And in fact, I think most believers in my country support that principle. They realize that for us to have true religious freedom, the government has to be neutral. It's only the fringe right-wingers who think that our country is a Christian country and we need prayer in the governments. But um, our group has two purposes. The first purpose is to work to keep state and church separate. The second one is to educate the public about the views of non-believers. Why are you an atheist or an agnostic or a free thinker? Um, in fact, I have some evidence that atheism is true. I have a secular miracle. Do you want to see it? You know what this is? This is a, a coffee cup, Tim Horton coffee cup. Some of us went downstairs before the meeting tonight, had some coffee, and they told me that if you roll up the edge of this thing, you might win a prize. Everybody rolled up an edge and didn't win anything. I did not pray, <laughs> but I rolled this thing up <laughs> and by not praying, I won cafe ou latte, cafe or latte. <laughs> so isn't that proof that prayer, that not praying works? Isn't that evidence? This is, this is exhibit A, evidence that, in fact, I think I'll give this to Joe when he shows up as a, like a little thank you gift. Um, you know, I used to be a preacher and I'm not going to talk about anything that is prejudicial about our debate tonight. I just want to talk a little about, about state church separation. But, you know, preachers, did you know that the word reverend was a typo? Did you know that? The first letter originally was an N. All right, so I thought this was an educated crowd. <laughs> preachers can talk forever and ever and ever. He, got, he finally got it. All right, there he goes. <laughs> Sometimes physicists are in a different world, so uh, from linguistics. But um, in my country, we have a, a wonderful Bill of Rights, and uh, in Canada, there's something similar. What do you call it? The Declaration or something? Charter of Rights. The Charter, yeah. Uh, in our Bill of Rights, we have what's called the First Amendment, which um, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or, and then it goes on with the other four freedoms, uh, the, the freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and freedom to petition. Those five freedoms that appear in our First Amendment are collectively often referred to as the freedom of conscience. We live in a country that is proudly rebellious. We fought a revolutionary war, kicking out the Lord, the King, the Sovereign, the Dictator. And instead of having a country that's based underneath some sovereign authority, like a monarch or a god or a religion, we turned everything upside down and said, we the people. We the people run this country. It's not some authority from some whatever sovereign up there. And we fought a revolutionary war to get rid of that so that the government would not interfere with freedom of conscience. The government just stays neutral, which is great. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons why religion has flourished so much in the United States is because the government is backing off and allowing all of us to have our opinions and agree or disagree. In the United States, we are free to disagree on religious issues, but what we are not free to do is ask our government to settle the argument. The government has to stay out of it. The government has to be non-informed about religion. In fact, our census doesn't even ask religion. Our government is a secular government, and under a secular government, those freedoms then allow religion to flourish. And I happen to know that most Christians, 
Uh, most Jews uh, in the United States support that. In fact, we have, when we take lawsuits, we are often joined by believers who agree that it's important for the government. Uh, a lot of believers don't want the government representing them. They think it cheapens their religion if the government gets involved, although the right-wingers don't. The extreme right-wing types, uh, the fundamentalist types, do think that uh, our government is Christian or religious and we should be promoting religion. So. That's where most of our work comes from at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. We are based in Madison, Wisconsin. It's a national organization starting in the mid-1970s. I came on in 1985, in 1987 full-time. And we now have four full-time attorneys. And uh, we, we, if we had room, we would hire some more. Uh, we're about to expand our building. Our group is growing really fast, uh, partly because uh, on this continent, do you know what the fastest growing religion is right now? Non-religion. Non you read our newspaper, don't you? <laughs> is it Justin, right? Um, the fastest growing religion in the United States right now is non-religion. It's growing faster. Christianity is shrinking. Judaism is shrinking. Jews are a very respected minority in my country at about 1.2%. Non-believers, uh, depending how you count, are maybe 9 or 10%, but non-religious are almost 20%, people who have no religious identification at all, which is pretty significant, but considering the fact that in 1990, uh, it was about 7% non-religious. Today, it's almost 20. Look at that growth of the non-religious, and a lot of that growth we're seeing among young people, among college groups like this. There's talk about the 30 under 30. 30% uh, 30 of those who are under 30 are non-religious. That is good. I think that's good for the country to be less divisive, to be more inclusive. But we are still fighting the religious right in our country in a lot of places where they haven't got the news yet about state church separation. So um, mayors who open city council meetings with a prayer to Jesus, for example. If you're going to city council for some reason and you're not Christian, but you're having to go to a secular meeting and listen to someone else's religion, how does that make you feel? doesn't make you feel like a full participant. It might be prejudicial against you. So our lawyers and our legal action, we complain about that, and sometimes we take lawsuits. Right now we have 12 lawsuits challenging violations of state church separation all over the country. Uh, and we, in fact, we're, we have some federal lawsuits. We have three lawsuits against the IRS in our country. One is on politicking in federal court. One is on the fact that clergy in the United States get a tremendous tax break by not having to report their housing. Can you imagine if you could just exclude your housing from your tax liability? We're suing over that, that's not fair. I used to take it when I was a minister. I used to take advantage of that, but now that I um, am not working for God, I don't get that same break, so we're suing over that. We. Um, we have uh, lawsuits over a big Jesus statue, a big Roman Catholic Sacred Heart of Jesus Jesus statue in a federal park in Montana. We have Team Jesus. He's oh, skiing Jesus. Is that what it's called? Um, and uh, we have uh, Ten Commandments monuments on public high school property. We're suing over that. So um, we, could, we could take a lot more lawsuits. Last year, our legal staff fielded more than 2,400 complaints, almost 2,500 complaints from around the country about violations of state church separation. Uh, about 800 of those could be closed pretty quickly, but about 1,600 were live, real complaints, and we sent out more than 1,000 letters uh, advising these high school principals or superintendents of school districts or mayors or, or whatever that they're breaking the law. And in many cases, they said, oh, we didn't know, thank you. And they stopped, just from a letter. We had, out of those like, almost 1,100 letters, about 150, I forget exactly, 152, 158 clear victories without going to court, which is pretty neat. It's kind of like in, in your case, we're Shauna. It's kind of like in Shauna's case, you know, without going to court, just asking, and then the abuse is corrected. It's not like we're telling Christians that they can't put up nativity scenes, we're telling mayors of a secular government you can't put the Christian nativity scene on the front steps of your secular building. I walk by a nativity scene every year on my way home from work. And even though I think it's kind of tacky and kind of weird, I applaud their freedom. 
to worship their God the way they want. I applaud their freedom to put up their nativity scene and religious symbols should be on the property of the people who promote that religion. That's what freedom is. That's what the freedoms of conscience are. So um, we work for state church separation and that First Amendment that I just quoted to you, they give those five freedoms. The, uh, before those five freedoms are acknowledged, they're not granted. Our freedoms are not granted to us by the government. You wouldn't say, please give me a freedom. They are acknowledged as human freedoms, the freedom to think your own thoughts, worship it as you wish. Before those freedoms are given, first there's a non-freedom. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. The government's hands are tied. The government has a restriction put on it that it cannot do anything respecting an establishment, which means leaning towards or dealing with an establishment of religion. The government has to be neutral. And only then, when the government is neutral, can we citizens have total freedom to think what we wish or not think, or go to church or to pray or to stand on your head and worship Thor or whatever. Uh, uh, what day of the week is it today? Yeah, we have a day of the week acknowledging a Norse god. Um, there is no Jesus day, is there? At least in our country. Uh, and yet, most people realize, well, okay, you know, that was, that was an ancient religion. We have the name in our calendars. Uh, tomorrow is Frigg's Day, Frigg's Day, uh, Friday. Um, and yet, uh, we realize that we have outgrown those ancient beliefs, even though we do acknowledge them a little bit in our language. Nobody really... The fact that we have a Thursday doesn't mean anyone here worships Thor. There might be. Are there any Nordic people here that... Usually there's one in every crowd that says they still believe in Thor. So, uh, there we go. The flying spaghetti monster, okay. So, um, we sometimes get accused of being anti-religious. Philosophically, yeah, most atheists and agnostics are anti-religious. But we are not anti-religious freedom. We are not barging into churches. We're not interrupting people's private, we're not, we're not going on front lawns, we're not, if, if somebody's gonna pray and bow their, bow their head and pray before, we're not gonna do that, we're not gonna be like rude, but if the religious people are using our government property to intrude with their religious messages on the property that belongs to all of us, well that's what's rude and we're just trying to clean that up to make it neutral. Some believers, and I know that you can't paint them all with the same brush, because uh, most of them are really good, smart people. But some believers over here on this edge can't distinguish between neutrality and hostility. They think if you're asking the government to be neutral, that that's a hostile act against their religion. The fact that they can't put up a nativity scene on their city court. Why, why do you hate religion? And we're trying to say, wait, you have your freedoms. Just don't meddle with my freedom. Let's keep our government totally secular and keep state and church apart. Should I put this, for, or where should I put this? We still have a few more minutes? Well, can I tell one more story? Do we have time for another story? Okay. Actually, I have some lights here to control things later on. Everybody's probably wondering what these lights are for. You'll find out in a few minutes. Yeah. Um, uh, at our annual convention a year and a half ago, um, we gave an award to a Broadway composer his name is Charles Strauss. How many of you know who Charles Strauss is? Some of you do? Uh, he's in his 80s now. He wrote Annie. The sun will come up tomorrow. He wrote Bye Bye Birdie. He wrote all sorts of great songs. In fact, there's a whole bunch of composers who are non-religious. The Gershwins and Richard Rogers and Cole Porter, who had to come out of two closets. Um, uh, Yip Harburg and Jerome Kern and Irving Berlin. And so, uh, you know, all this wonderful music that we sing and know, written by non-believers. <coughs> So we were happy to, when we interviewed him on a radio show that he's been a lifelong atheist and he was so happy to find another group of atheists finally in his 80s. So he came to our convention in Connecticut to accept an award and uh, we gave him this Emperor Has No Clothes Award for being outspoken about his atheism. And he got up and he said, you know, I'm not much for giving speeches. Do you mind if I just sit at the piano and play a few songs? And so he did. Were any of you there in Connecticut last time? No? Okay. He sat at the piano and he sang a lot of his songs. Uh, Once Upon a Time, that beautiful ballad that he wrote, some Bye Bye Birdie things and uh, things from Annie. But before he got up, we were having dinner and uh, talking about music and all that. And, and then he turned to me and he said, this is so great. 
to be in a group of non-believers. I need to write a song about non-belief. I need to write, this would be great to do this. Uh, and he said, send me some lyrics and I'll set them to music. And I thought, whoa. So I did. And he did. So there's a brand new song which just came out on our brand new album. Um, it, it took me like six months to come up with words that I thought would work for, for someone like him. And when he got my lyrics, uh, he said, these are, these are good lyrics, but do you mind if I do some judicious editing? I said, you're the pro, I mean, really, whatever. So he threw out about two thirds of my words. He just, <laughs> uh, and we came up with a song called Poor Little Me. Um, I wish there was a piano here, I could do it for you. Um, some of the words are, um, Lutherans have liturgies, Calvinists have creeds, Muslims have their minarets, Catholics have their beads, Methodists have methods, holy truth to ascertain, but poor little me, I only have a brain. <laughs> Well, I won't do the whole song for you, it's cute. And it's actually not poking fun at anybody, and it's not saying believers don't have brains. It's, not, it's just saying poor little me, you know? So, um, uh, it's on the new album called Adrift on a Star, which also has a Cole Porter song on there that I'd never heard of before called Experiment. Uh, one of the lines in that song that Cole Porter wrote, the apple at the top of the tree is never too high to achieve, so take an example from Eve and experiment. Uh, <laughs> It's a pretty cute little tune. Uh, and then a, a George Gershwin song and some new songs. So uh, we have a couple of them at the back, but if you're interested in some of the products, the music, and that work of the foundation, you can find us at ffrf.org. Thank you very much, uh, Dan, for that very uh, entertaining presentation. And your musical talents came through very clearly, as, as well as your um, skills as a former preacher. So <laughs> and it's a, it has stood you in good stead, I would think. I forgot to take a collection. Uh, a collection, right? Well, it's never too late. There's, there's still time. Um, you know, another aspect to this uh, whole discussion that we won't get into tonight because we're talking, uh, it's a, a, the debate itself will be narrowly focused on uh, the question of the uh, afterlife, but I alluded a little uh, while ago to the, um, my interest in the conflicts between, or apparent conflicts between science and religion. Um, people like Richard Dawkins uh, insist. Uh, how many people know who Richard Dawkins is? Put up, put up your hands. Please. Just what everybody's read. Let's try a few more. What about Christopher Hitchens? Okay, everybody's in. Uh, Daniel Dennett. Isn't that, okay, well, a very well, well educated, uh, well read audience. Uh, what's that? Oh, Sam Harris, of course. Yeah, Sam Harris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moral Landscape is his, his most recent. Uh, my, uh, don't Michael Sherman, what, what is he? Skeptics. Oh, Shermer, oh, of course, yeah, Shermer, yeah, 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 of course, Michael Shermer, yeah. yeah Scientific American, he writes, uh, Scientific American. Alan uh, Stoltenberg. Who's Al? I don't know him, here's... Oh, the da David Hume, yeah, of our time. Of course, it was, it was David Hume who uh, first talked about the... Um, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, who, is this which? He talked about miracles. Well, uh, no, but he, al he also talked about the, uh, na the na naturalistic, was it naturalistic fallacy, uh, which is of, of key importance in this whole uh, discussion, that uh, you cannot deduce what ought to be from what is. In other words, you can't deduce moral principles from, uh, from the laws of nature. And uh, uh, so uh, th this really is at the heart of, of the difference between science and, uh, and, and religion that science describes the way things are. So it's, it's neither good nor evil that the earth goes around the sun. 
ah, that, that's just the, the way things are, the laws of nature are the way things are, but there's no value, Na the laws of nature have no intrinsic value associated with them. And uh, what, uh, what Sam Harris tries to do is to show that, that at least in, in very simple cases, the, the cho uh, choices are, uh, are, are fairly obvious, but as soon as you start to get into more complex moral dilemmas, it's, it's no longer so obvious, and so the, that's where the distinction between good and evil uh, starts to become uh, a question of judgment that cannot be deduced from the, from the laws of nature. And uh, so, uh, so that's why I think that there is no uh, fundamental contradiction between science and religion because they're talking about completely different things. One is describing the natural world around us, the laws of nature, and the other is describing human values, human interactions. And so the fundamental question, the fundamental belief, I, I guess, is whether you think that, uh, that human values and, uh, and judgments can be deduced from uh, laws of nature. And uh, so, so uh, I, 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 my answer to that would be that the, 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 they cannot. There's an essential um, cultural component that comes, that has emerged over the millennia. Uh, that uh, has resulted in our, our collective wisdom. And actually, I'm starting to border very much. I can't go, I shouldn't go much further with this because I'll soon be talking about uh, uh, things connected to the uh, afterlife. But uh, um, I guess the, uh, the key point I wanted to make, though, is that, is that in particular, um, um, the, who, uh, I'm forgetting names. The, the, the first, um, the, the first author, the British one, Dawkins. yeah, Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins. He he insists that the reader choose between science and religion. And I'm, say, I'm saying that's really a false dichotomy. They're, t they're just going in different dimensions. It's like instead of instead of religion on one end and science on the other, and you and you put your <laughs> your position somewhere in between those two. That, the, that science, is, let's say, is going this way, religion is in, in a completely uh, different axis. It's not, so it, you can put your position on a plane rather than, than uh, on a line. And so you can have equal amounts of religion and science in, in your psychology, in your, in your worldview, uh, without there being a contradiction. So that's, uh, uh, I guess, my bit of uh, philosophizing about, about the, uh, this, uh, Question of a conflict between science uh, and and religion. Uh, let's see. We still have a few minutes. Any comments? And, and I mean, why don't we have some discussion? Well, make a claim. And make, it, make a claim. Okay. My my claim is there is no contradiction between science and religion. But the claim of the afterlife is a testable claim. Uh, it, it, that's testable. Well, yeah, that's now we're getting into the debate, so I can't. Uh, <laughs> we'll make a claim like religion that the Earth is less than ten thousand. It's scientifically not true, but uh, but also it's not an essential component of religion. Just so you, you you pick the hill you want to die on, and then let's test it. Right? Like how far back do you want to go? To God created everything, but what created God? Right? It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> Well, what I would what I would say uh, that the that the the purpose of the creation story is is not to explain where the where the uh, earth or where the universe came from, uh, because the people who who did that writing uh, didn't have the knowledge base to make any, re and we still don't we still don't know. I mean, that's still what's that? The the purpose of the creation story I, I would say is to tell us who God is, not not where the universe came from. So it's it's setting the stage. It's saying these are the characters. You have an over, in a, in a play. You have an opening scene. It's very scene. apparent. The, 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 the objective of the creation story is to end the debate and have everybody become sub subservient. Yeah. It's it's very obvious. I mean, you know, to an intelligent mind, you know, one one shouldn't even have to lab belabor the point. The creation story, you it, indefinite, trying to struggle to understand or give any kind of understanding to what is indefinite. That's not what creationists will, will agree to. Creationists want your brain to be lazy. You want, yeah. They want you to stop there. And yeah. the men yeah. of cloth, particularly the men of cloth, they want you to become subservient to them. 
some people may want that, but it's not it's not required. Um, yeah. If morality cannot come, cannot evolve through nature, then how do you explain moral non-believers? How do I explain what? How do you explain morality amongst non-believers if morality the cannot question. come through nature? How, how do I explain it? Because we, uh, <clears throat> the we've been um, our, our whole moral system, our uh, our, law, uh, our legal system, uh, government all comes from that uh, religious background and tradition. Uh, it's it's like that. saying uh, it's like saying you know how how do you you have language because you were taught language at your mother's knee, and the same is true for many of your moral values. Right, so until the Bible, until the Sermon on the Mount, we didn't know not to kill each other, is what you're saying. Like if we required... No, well, that's, that goes back to the Ten Commandments, and, and that uh, um, uh, I'm sure much older than that. But but there, there had to be a time when people had to figure that out. That in order to live together, you can't, you have to have some... Uh, yeah. Okay, so we're, we're going to change. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dan, did you want to uh, maybe call for some questions on 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 your? say thank you, Gordon. That was uh, articulate. That would be a total debate, because I, I disagree with you radically on that whole thing, but that's not so nice debate, is it? You and I should do a debate yeah. on that issue. Yeah. Yeah. That would be fun. <laughs> Go ahead. You have, somebody has a question? Sure. Uh, I'm an atheist myself, so I ask this question from both sides. I ask Christians, what do you need to see to give up Christianity? So I'm just going to ask you, what do you need to see to believe in Jesus again? Uh, it, sh should, I re should I answer that question? Because it might be a little bit relative to the debate. I'd, I'd be glad to, but uh, um, I, I guess I can say it cleanly enough without uh, being prejudicial. Um, s some evidence of supernatural power. Uh, the Bible very clearly says, All things whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, believing, you shall receive. The prayer of faith will heal the sick. The Bible is very clear about how prayer is answered. Uh, in the Bible, the God of the Bible is, is depicted as giving prophecies to people who then spoke these things which supposedly came true, although most of them didn't. But still, uh, I'll give you one example. I can think of a hundred of them, but suppose... Gordon were to tell me that he was praying, and God told him that tomorrow at 12.13, a meteorite coming from the south-southwest at an 83 degree angle, traveling at a certain velocity, were to hit his house, not mine, <laughs> go through the Navajo rug on the second floor, end up 17 inches below the base of the uh, basement floor, composed of 82% iron and 1% iridium and so on, weighing so many ounces. <coughs> and if that happened, I would say, oh, there's some solid evidence that there is a God, because Gordon believed his Bible, he listened to this God who supposedly speaks to him, who doesn't lie to him, and he told the prophecy, and that prophecy came true. Something like that. Or if Jesus were to materialize here on the table, in the, in the New Testament, Jesus materialized out of thin air and apparently walked through a door and he disappeared. He did this disappearing act on the road to Emmaus, you know, that whole thing. So if that were to happen here, we would catch it on videotape and we could all agree, whoa. Or if, uh, and if Jesus were to say, by the way, the Ark of the Covenant, if he would give us the exact latitude and longitude, the exact coordinates where we could dig for the Ark of the Covenant, something like that, something that we could test and see 
not anecdotes, not historical stories of some things that may or may not have happened, but some real testable evidence. I'm open to that. It would be silly to ignore something like a God. If there's a God, that would be an amazing fact about the universe, wouldn't it? I would have a million questions to ask this being. Um, I might ask to apologize, too, for some things, but in any event, uh, <laughs> um, or I might even say I forgive you, you know, but in any event, uh, uh, something, something testable and repeatable, something that we can't wishy-washy deny because of interpretations. I'm open to it. I mean, every atheist that I know is open to evidence, and we would be glad to change our minds. It doesn't necessarily mean we would admire or worship that being, but we would acknowledge its existence if there were strong evidence for it. Well, since I'm moderator, I have to stay neutral uh, in, in this. Uh, but let, let me just say that, that if there were proof either way, if there were proof that God did exist or God didn't exist, that would surely put an end to religion. It would, it would no longer be a matter of, uh, of belief. <laughs> well, uh, you, you, you're free to embark on that journey uh, now or any time you choose. We have another question. <laughs> Um, thanks. I just wanted to ask you this question. Uh, I think a lot of students who are in university can sort of relate to this. Uh, when we go to school and we come across new beliefs, whether it's, you know, belief or disbelief in God or feminism or becoming a vegan or whatever, um, i found there's often a break between the moment when you have a change of belief and the social environment that you're in. And so I was... Like, I haven't read your book, uh, so I was wondering, like, did you, like, obviously you must have stopped believing while you were a priest, right? What was that like? Like, did you just continue preaching, or was it just like one morning you woke up and you were like, I'm finished, or yeah. what, what was the transition? Yeah, well, it's, it's different for every person. I know hundreds of other former clergy, priests, ministers, who have given up their belief in the supernatural. In fact, there's a new group called the Clergy Project. Go to clergyproject.org. Richard Dawkins, uh, Daniel Dennett, who we've heard their names, uh, Linda Lascola and myself have started this group two years ago now. For clergy who have given up their faith, they didn't lose their faith, they threw away their faith, because faith is not a valid tool of knowledge, but they're still trapped in the ministry in there's more than 400 in the group now, and about a fourth of those are still in the pulpit and want to get out, but some of them can't. Uh, this guy named Adam, that's not his real name, he's in East Tennessee, he's a minister in a conservative church. More than two years ago, he became an atheist, but he can't find any other job, and so, and his wife is disabled, and she needs the health care, and he can't leave, you know, because he loves his family, he's really trapped in a horrible situation. He would love to find a way out. He would love to. So the clergy project is now raising money for grants to help re uh, retrain. Who's going to hire somebody with a divinity degree, you know, in East Tennessee and these, you know. So, uh, but in my case, this was kind of ancient history now, but my back in the 1980s. It was the summer of 83 that I knew I, after four or five years of reading and gradually moving across the theological spectrum. It wasn't overnight. It was a agonizing four or five years until I finally dumped out all the bath water and I said, hey, there's no baby there. It's just, you know. <laughs> um, and so in the summer of 83, I knew I was an atheist uh, in my mind, but I still had a calendar of speaking events. And so I have to confess, I didn't have a calendar of speaking events. I didn't have a calendar of speaking events. I didn't have a calendar of speaking events. I didn't have a Oh, okay. so I have to confess that for about four months I was a bit I, I didn't know how to stop. I mean, I should have stopped, you know what I mean? But I was in 20. I've been through this. And I still had preaching engagements. I was a traveling evangelist at the time. Yeah. But that was kind of interesting uh, because I was up in the pulpit and I was saying these things that I no longer believe. I knew that the Bible was not the Bible. I knew that the evidence of God were not good even though I had preached in every book of the Bible. And yet people were still saying amen. People were still coming forward to get saved. And it was, I was like, I shouldn't be doing this. I need to stop it. And after one of my sermons that I didn't believe anymore, but I was still preaching, which is horrible, a woman came up to me and she said, Reverend Barker, I want you to know, I really felt the Spirit of God on your ministry tonight. 
<laughs> and I'm thinking, you did? <laughs> and so what does that tell you about this drama that religion is? She was feeling something, and I guess I used to preach that the Word of God has its effect no matter you know, who says it, even if, the, even if the demons or even if atheists say it. I don't know which is worse. But, um, uh, but in any event, I saw that. You know, people, the very last time I preached, it was up in uh, Central California, and it's people feeling the same thing and crying and all that, and I finally said enough, I had to stop, and I sent out a letter to everybody. It took about a year of readjusting my brain. It took about a year, and I think some psychologists suggest that whenever there's a big change in your life, like a divorce or a death in the family or something like that, it takes a while for the brain to readjust and social things to readjust. I lost a lot of friends that I thought were really good friends. Which means, were they really friends to begin with? If something like that ruined our friendship, were they really friends? I guess maybe I didn't lose anything. That's a conditional friendship. You know, it's a contingent friendship. As long as we're in the same group, I like you, but if you're not, then you're not my friend anymore. Um, but I, some, I'm still friends with some of those Christian people back then who were good, and we, we're just good friends. We like each other. So that's a good way to test your friendships, by the way. You know, if you're a believer or a non-believer. Imagine going to the atheist club and telling everybody that you just, you know, fell in love with the Virgin Mary. And you're, you know, I mean, whatever. Uh, um, so, um, so it was tough, but I found out there's a huge, broad world out there of really good people. Good non-believers and believers alike. Uh, most atheists would say people should be judged not by what they believe, but by how they act, how they live their lives. That's how you judge people, not by what creed they profess. But, uh, so, but my story is different from everyone else's, but in my case I was lucky. My mom and dad both later became atheists, which is pretty amazing, because they were seminary educated and Sunday school teachers, and my mom uh, told a reporter once, she said, oh, it's so great now that I'm an atheist, I don't have to hate anymore. She said, I don't have to decide who's in and who's out, who's the good people, who's the bad people, which people, you know what I mean, who's the enemies, who are the darkness out there, and we are the true blue. You know, she's just, I can just be a human being now, just be a real loving, caring human being. So, sorry, I'm talking too long. Is that Derek? Uh, Dan, you're, organization is called Atheist Alliance, and you primarily promote secularism with, within government and the institutional bodies that make up our society. How do you respond to the notion that secularism privileges atheists over other groups? Uh, the only people who would say that would be extreme believers. I mean, not everybody's going to say that there's a privileging uh, uh, of other groups. It's like what I said before, some people can't distinguish between neutrality and hostility. They think being neutral is privileging atheism when it's not. We are not asking for the government to put up there is no God and Jesus is a myth banners at, at City Hall. We're not asking for that. We're just asking the government to be neutral. Don't take for or against. That's what we're pushing for is that neutrality. Um, and what's the privilege? There's churches on almost every corner. People have total freedom. I mean, you can hardly turn on the radio or the TV without hearing religion, a sermon, or music. I mean, religion is everywhere. It's not like people are being denied an opportunity. To, you know, so the, the privileging, I think, comes with tax breaks to religion, uh, with uh, a lot of religious iconography or symbols in our government. There's a lot of privileging pro-religion in a lot of our governments. We're just trying to push toward neutrality. It's kind of like if you, have a, a, if, if you have a large debt that's canceled, it doesn't put any money in the bank. It just brings you up to zero. But it still feels good, doesn't it? to get up to zero. That's what we're trying to fight for in our countries, to make sure the government stays zero with religion, neither for nor against. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Barker. Um, quick question. Uh, you kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything more about it. Uh, could you maybe define a little, a little bit more maybe uh, your theology before you became an atheist and sort of your duties as a minister? And, I don't know. Anything else you want to say about that? Yeah. Um, well, I was born into a religious family. My mom and dad became born-again Christians really early in the marriage. Uh, they met in a dance band. They were both musicians. In fact, you can see my dad on some old movies. 
You ever seen that movie Easter Parade with Judy Garland and Fred Astaire? That's my dad playing the trombone solo in there. And Judy Garland comes oh, up really? and puts her hand on his shoulder, and he's like, "Oh, is that really Judy Garland?" Um, and, but then when they started having babies, they went to church. Uh, my dad was in the Christian church, if you know what that is, uh, the Disciples of Christ tradition. And uh, we were really devout church twice on Sundays and Wednesday night Bible studies. And when I was a young teenager, um, I became a born-again Christian myself, as a Bible-believing Christian. And I used to preach and used to believe that God has no grandchildren. Each, each person has to make their own decision. You're not, a Christian, you're not a Christian child just because you're in a Christian family. You have to make your own. So I confessed my sins. I accepted Jesus into my heart and asked Him to be my personal Savior to make me that new creature that the Bible promises. And when I did that, you know, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. I did that, I confessed, and I felt, I used to believe you didn't have to have the feelings, but I did have the feelings also, kind of like a dessert. This total feeling of love and, and, and of peace that passes understanding. You know, I knew that if I had died at that moment, I would go to heaven because Jesus had died for my sins and his resurrection from the dead was evidence that there would be life after death. Oh, we're straying a little bit, aren't we here? But in any event, um, uh, then when I was 15, I accepted what I was convinced was a call to the ministry. And it was Bible believing. Uh, that at the time, we were in a charismatic church, which was loosely uh, associated with the Assemblies of God, which are Pentecostal, although I wasn't that noisy. Um, I think, there's, I think they're sweet people, they're sincere people, but way too noisy for my personal taste. But in any event, uh, so I thought the world was ending at any minute. I thought, you know, as a thief in the night, no, night, no man knows the hour. And so I preached. Uh, I believed that the world could be any time. You know, the fig tree and Jesus talked about this generation shall not pass away and the signs. And Hal Lindsey, I booked him to come to our college, he assured us that the second coming of Jesus could not be any later than the mid-1980s, based upon his interpretation of biblical prophecy. I think he's still on TV saying stuff. He's pushing the date, of course. But, uh, uh, so I was that kind of a Bible-believing, full gospel, feeling the Holy Spirit. I prayed, I saw what I was convinced were answers to prayer. Uh, I was an associate pastor in a friend's church, an Assembly of God church, and then in a charismatic Christian church. And then I was a cross-country evangelist for eight years, and then a Christian songwriter. I'm still getting royalties even now, for, <laughs> which is weird, you know, from some of the musicals that I wrote back then. And so I was a true believer, and sometimes Christians try to say, well, Dan, if you were a true Christian, you would never have left it. If you really had known Jesus... I believed it. I felt it. I saw evidence. I saw what I was convinced were answers to prayer. And if I was not a true believer, then nobody is. And the Bible even says, you shall know them by their fruits, right? It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what someone else thinks. You shall know them by their fruits. And my life exhibited all of the fruits of the Spirit. People were saved. People were born again. I lived by faith. I saw all that. I believed it 100%. And I loved it. And I rejected it not because I didn't like it. I rejected it for purely intellectual reasons because I learned that it's not true. We should not believe something no matter what we wish. We should not believe something that's not true. So, any further yeah, I've questions? Got a question. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm happy to see that there's someone who has a uh, science background on stage because I know very little about science. Uh, there was an article in the Windsor Star a while ago that tried to say that evolution uh, violated, what was it, one of the laws of thermodynamics. And I'm just wondering, what is the connection between, if any, between thermodynamics and evolution? Can you explain that for me? Well, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, this is often quoted as a, uh, a violation of the law. The first law, let me give a little bit of a hit, uh, uh, physics uh, uh, background: The first law of thermodynamics says that you have to conserve energy. In other words, you you uh, you, uh, you you can't get something for nothing. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics says that in the course of time, uh, systems become more random. Another, and so you, you can't. Not only can you not win, but you can't break even. The system will always run down. But this is only in a closed system. And of course, the uh, the Earth is uh, is not a closed system. 
um, and there's a very uh, easy way of understanding how the Earth and all the living creatures in it uh, manage to uh, um, get around the second law of thermodynamics. This idea that if you have like a tray of coins, if they're all heads and you shake the tray, then after a while some of the heads will become tails and, and it becomes random. Well, for the, uh, the Earth as a whole, it's, it's not a closed system. You, so you can think of it very easily in terms of, uh, of uh, blue photons coming from the sun being uh, absorbed and then radiated as heat, which are red photons. And there are more red photons because they have lower energy per photon than, than blue ones. And so, you, so, there's a, uh, and, and so the living systems are extracting some uh, order out of this, but there's still a net increase in uh, randomness for the, for the si complete system of, uh, of Earth plus its, its uh, surroundings. So, so that, that's the technical answer to, to your, your question, that, uh, that with the uh, input of, of energy and the ability to radiate away heat, the uh, living systems can, um, can achieve order at the expense of creating more disorder someplace else.